Up next, Paul Wiedemeyer, KE5LKY, going to be talking about using UDP CAS to IP multicast data over amateur packet radio. Uh, my topic here will be uh, a tool called UDP CAS that I'm using to multicast uh, data over packet radio, primarily two, or 20, two meter radio. Um, this is the outline of what I'm going to talk about. It kind of mirrors what's in the paper. And I, I read the paper again this morning, and it's like, you know, it's like, wow, did, I, did I really write that? And of course, you've heard that before. It's like, all right, that's what I wrote. Um, a little bit about myself what we go, before we go on to that. Um, I'm uh, sorry, I, when I teach, I roam, and I kind of get in my students' face, especially when I see their eyeballs rolling up in their heads. So I need a tether to keep myself uh, stationary here. So I apologize if I shift and go back and forth. Um, we're a comprehensive regional university uh, located in upper, uh, the northeast corner of the state. Uh, I don't have graduate students. I have undergraduate students. Currently, I have three that are working with me. Uh, so those, those of you who've dealt with undergraduates, you know all the trials and tribulations of dealing with that. Um, I teach uh, nine hours a semester, so I do most of my research on whatever time is left over. Of course, I have copious amounts of time, uh, not. Uh, so we're very new to this field of amateur radio. Uh, I've been licensed less than two years, and in fact, the, the hardware that I have, I've had for less than probably nine months. And so for me, it's, all right, I need to, to crawl before I walk and walk before I run. So my, my basic premise here is I need to get something up and running. I'm going to play with it. I'm going to see what I can do. So I need, need to get some hardware. I got some hardware. And I need some software to be able to transmit the data that I need to transmit with. And I'll, I'll show you that configuration of what I've got uh, a little bit later on in, the, in these slides. But eventually, my biggest interest was always dealing with multicast data. I, mean, I was interested in point-to-multi-point -point transmission of data. The question is, is there software available for me to do that? And if so, what do I need to do? Or do I need to write my own software? And so that's really where this journey started. What, what's available for me as a basic a novice amateur ham radio dealing with data transmission that I can use and implement quickly? That's the basic premise of where this came from. And the idea for this paper really transpired maybe around April or June, or April or May of this year, after I had some experience with using this tool. Once I found it, it's like, aha, this is great. This, is, this, this satisfies what my needs are. And so I'm presenting this to you saying, all right, if I can do this, you can do this. And it's actually fairly, quite, or fairly simple to implement, download, install and start multicasting data, point to multipoint, over your two meter uh, radio networks. And, and I'm going to move to, to 440 here eventually when I buy some more hardware. So that's the premise of where this came from. This is the basic, uh, this is the topical outline with regards to the paper, and I'm going to try to adhere to that and then throw other things in uh, as needed. So if you read the paper, and if you don't, I'm not going to feel slighted, it's all right. I mean, there's plenty of papers in there to read. but I'm interested in, in e-com. I'm, I'm interested in the data e-com part. I mean, I'm, I'm the folks that I'm with locally, they're doing voice e-com. I'm interested in the data e-com part, and we're a very small area. There's, there's people that are doing voice e-com, but very few of us are doing data e-com. So I'm interested in that. And so I, I, I say, all right, you know, we need to transmit data during emergencies. Yes. Uh, transmit the data must be accomplished with speed, reliability, and efficiency. Yes. I don't you know, the, the, the high level, yes, we need to do this type of thing. Based on what I see and talking to the folks in my area that are doing data e-com, I find that we've using the traditional uh, applications that rely on the TCP IP stack. Uh, you have a transmission, you have a receive. You transmit and you receive, you transmit and receive, and of course, the tools that I use, the FTP, secure copy, uh, and then even WinLink and AirMail, again, you're, you're transmitting and the data is being received for reliability purposes. And that's fine. That's, that's perfectly fine. <clears throat> One of the things that I'm interested in, though, is not just pure textual data, is that I'm also interested in imagery. And I'm not real concerned if portions of that image, if it were transmitted, get clobbered. Um, and I'll explain a little bit later why that is. So, I mean, there's another caveat here I'll add to this. I'm interested in imagery transmission, but I don't, I, if, the, if the image gets clobbered, that's fine. 
I'll still be able to, using the types of things that I want to do, I want to still be able to recognize portions of the image, and if portions of the image aren't there, that's fine. It's perfectly all right with me. So, you know, I'm not really interested in reliable transmission. The textual data, that's fine. I'll do that. But imagery, I don't care. I, I, things get clobbered, that's fine. So, in doing that then, when I look at what is available, I want to do basically UDP over IP. And the tools available to do that then would push me towards a multicast environment because many of the tools that I've seen or that I've seen use multicast, use UDP over IP. So my niche then is imagery over two meter. I'm going to go multicast. Now you can use the tool that I use for multicast to do reliable transmission of textual data. I'm looking at using the tool to reduce the amount of overhead or FEC as it was called for error correction down to the minimal. You can use it and include as much FEC as you need to for the transmissions that you need. Right? And that may be data. Right? So again, being new to this, I say, all right, what's available multicast wise for the amateur ham radio packet network stuff? And you know, you do your Google searching and so on and so forth. I found two packages, and Nick's wasn't there, and Dan's DRATs, although I was very interested in, in talking with Dan uh, offline about the DRAT software, because again, he does mention multicast, and I kind of have an understanding of how that works, at least with the DSTAR uh, protocol. But the stuff that I found had these following characteristics, and they either had two or all three of these characteristics. One, you need a dedicated server to multicast. You have a server that pushes data to multiple clients, which is fine if that's the application that you desire. Um, and the two so pieces of software that I found have that characteristic. Um, the second characteristic is that they're both written for Windows, which is not a detriment in some cases, but I'm looking at a Linux type environment. I'm looking at uh, having that available to me. So that it wasn't an option for me. And then the third characteristic is one of them is not actually actively supported. All right. So those are that's what I found. All right. Now, if you look at the presentation, then again, I'm, I'm going to talk about IP broadcast, IP multicast, unicast, uh, the software that was available, and then I'm going to start talking about the UDP, the UDP cast file transfer tool that I found and that I'm using. All right, so you know, the internet protocol's de facto standard within the TCPI protocol stack. Uh, its primary function is route data through the network infrastructure. Uh, you have IP addresses of the range A, B, C, D, uh, eight bit numbers, either assigned statically or you use DHCP or some other form to, to obtain an IP address. Uh, certain IP addresses have reserved func special functions. Um, the concept of unicast for me. And it may differ for you. So I, I, again, I, I, read the pack, I read the paper and I was like, man, did I really write that? Because there's some aspects of clarity that need to be addressed. Mine, when I see unicast, and, and this, you can do unicast over UP, UDP and not have any acknowledgments transmitted. But traditionally, and as I tell my students when I teach DACOM, if you're looking at unicast, IP unicast, you're generally talking about packets that are acknowledged. Now, that it doesn't have to be the case. It depends on the tool that you're using. And in fact, the tool that I'm using, you can do unicast, but you can do non-acknowledged packets. I can push a pure bit stream at my clients, one client, point to point, without any acknowledgments. The tool's primarily used for multicast, point to multi point, transmitting one single bit stream, but multiple receivers. But the traditional tools that we use rely on unicast, which in that case would require TCP, so you have an acknowledged packet that's coming, an ACK packet that's coming back. And again, most of the applications that we use, primarily using the TCP IP stack, are unicast oriented, which uh, would require the, the ACK, which of course then is things like FTP, uh, HTTP, so on and so forth, uh, WinLink, AirMail, so, and whatnot. All right, broadcast, uh, IP does have a broadcast function. Uh, that's point to multi point. It's just that everybody receives it. And there are applications that do broadcast, uh, primarily 
uh, multimedia applications. I list a couple in the paper that you can uh, investigate. That really wasn't my interest in, in saturating and saying, uh, sending it all to everybody and everybody receiving it. What I'm interested in is the limited function of broadcast, which of course in this case is multicast, which is still a point-to-multi-point -point -point transmission. It's just that only certain destinations decide that they want to receive the transmission from the sender. Um, now, if you're looking at IP multicast addresses, they fall within a certain range, this is, uh, and those are listed there. In fact, the, the IP address, the, the, a, the A number we use for in UDP cast is, is 236, so it falls within that range. And again, most of the applications that use multicast are using UDP over IP. In our environment, even if this was, um, you know, whatever net shared network, you know, destination D1, D3 are still going to see it. They're just not going to take in those packets. D2, D4 have decided they want to receive this transmission. They're going to take in those packets, and they're going to be happy. Um, but D1 and D2, or D1 and D3, they're going to see it, but they're just not going to take it in. Right? Uh, again, this is uh, where we're at. This is the traditional side, I suppose, of common TCP, IP, AX25. That's what we're using. Uh, IP, again, IP unicast, IP multicast, it exists. Again, unicast address, broadcast addresses, and multicast addresses. Uh, we're going to use the UDP function associated with the TCP IP stack. And then we're going to UDP cast. That's our application that sits on top of that. And so this is the stream that, which we'll use. So the survey that, well, survey, I mean, we're digging around and grepping. Again, I'm uh, new to this. Like, right, what's available? What are people using? And Locally, uh, there's a handful. There might, there might be five. I can count on one hand how many people are doing packet in my area. Most of them are you know, two-meter voice and stuff. But you know, when Gustav moved over us, uh, and I've told other this at the, at the conference, when Gustav moved over, I listened to two-meter vo voice, and it's, it's saturated. There's a lot of people out there. Net Control started up. Um, but Net Control was also attempting to set up a packet network. And there's a few people there. I mean, I recognize the call signs, so we're not very saturated in the packet. But through the hurricane, then it's like, all right, what data pack, data transmission is going on? Not much. All right. Um, now, when you start moving the multicast range, what I find is I found Radio Mirror and Altcast, and you may or may not be aware of these. Um, Radio Mirror was written by Dr. Hansen. Uh, W2FS, uh, several of you know who Dr. Hansen is. I think he had attended several of these earlier on. Um, Radio Mirror was released by Dr. Hansen in the mid-90s. Uh, supports VHF, UHF, amateur packet radio network transmissions of multicast. Requires a dedicated multicast server. So this is a, a single server pushing to multiple clients. All right. Doesn't necess it's, it doesn't fit the mold that I'm looking for. It's, it's not the solution that I was looking for. The solution I'm looking for is I want any client in my data network, local data network, to be able to transmit to any others and, and transmit by using multicast. And there are certain reasons for that. Hopefully I'll, I'll get to the end of the presentation here and you'll see that. But again, I'm still interested in imagery. Uh, but I want any location in our parish or adjacent parishes, if I'm using DigiPeters, to be able to, to see and be able to transmit multicast to any others that are connected to the emergency network. All right. It runs on 95, uh, and as I've stated in the paper, it does not appear to be actively supported. I have not talked to Dr. Hansen about that. Um, I probably should, but I do not see versions for even 2000 or Windows XP, so my assumption is it's not actively supported. Um, there is very little documentation about Radio Mirror. Uh, the stuff that I found was at the Tapper web website, and it was the, the, the source for the code. The source for the code actually is fairly well documented. Uh, and in fact, if you're interested in Radio Mirror as a multicast serving technology, uh, the documentation inside that's part of the source is, is was what I used to, and, and cite in the paper. I have not used Radio Mirror because, again, it's not the, the solution to the problem that I was trying to solve. Um, in further investigation, then, uh, I stumbled across Altcast, and Altcast is written by uh, Walt Fair Jr., W5ALT. Uh, it's a recent release, uh, primarily for HF, uh, which is fine. 
Um, I'm doing uh, VHF, UHF stuff. I'm, I, I'm assuming it could be modified to do UHF, VHF, but I haven't spoken with Walt about that. I did contact Walt and asks for some additional documentation with regard to Altcast. Uh, I have not used Altcast. Uh, I don't have the privileges to transmit at HF. I'm just a technician. Again, I've only been licensed less than 22 months. Uh, doesn't mean I can't do that. I just, again, the copious amounts of time that I have to try to study for my, my general and extra. That, that will come eventually. It just hasn't been a, there hasn't been a need yet. I'm, I'm transmitting data right now. Um, it does require a dedicated multicast server. Again, that's not the solution I was looking for. But again, if this is a tool that is of interest to you, you might look at that. Um, written for Microsoft XP, it is accurately supported. Again, um, I'm looking at a Linux type of uh, version for this, and so neither one of these provide me with the solution I'm looking for. If, this, if these two provide you with the solution you're looking for, that's fine. That's great, I'm not gonna chastise either one. I think they're great tools. Which then leads me to the fact that, all right, I still want to multicast. I'd like to use something in Linux. We got Linux in our labs. Um, two meter, 70 centimeter stuff, non-dedicated server. Okay, I'm stuck. <laughs> what do I do? All right, well, I have two options. I either find something or I write something. And of course, all that copious amounts of time I'm looking at start shrinking down to almost nothing. You know, the fact that I'm married and have two kids. I mean, so I happened to be working with one of our students in the lab. We've got a small lab that we maintain for our majors. And he and I were talking about, he maintains the lab. He was talking about re-imaging re our, our machines. And he pushes an image. He pushes an image from a server to multiple computer systems. And I said, well, I didn't really say it. I just got this aha. It's like, what about software on the Linux side to distribute operating system images. What's available? Now his, what he uses, is has a dedicated server and he's pushing a multiple passive clients. Well, they're passive from the standpoint they're not really participating, they're receiving this stream. So I started digging around, I said, all right, what's available from the standpoint of pushing operating system images? I stumbled across UDP cast. It was sheer dumb luck, I think, is what it was, or somebody was looking down on me and saying, all right, give this guy a break because all his copious amounts of time is being eaten up. UDP cast, is a tool that is used in the Unix Linux community primarily for distributing operating system images to many different computers that are attached to the same local area network. It was written by Alan Knaff, released roughly about the early 19, or 2000s, uh, and it's released under the GNU General Public License 2.2, open source. It is available for Linux Unix. It is also available for Microsoft Windows XP. The piece that I like about this that really draws me to this tool is the fact that I don't have to have a dedicated client. The software, when installed, comes in two parts. A server piece of, or a sender software and a receiver software. What that means is, is that any given computer can transmit data to any willing receiving computer that has the software installed. And then conversely, any receiving, student or receiving computer then can turn around and act as a sender and transmit to any of the other computers that wish to receive. There's two pieces of software that are involved, and I'll mention both. And it's actively supported. UDPCast has two parts to it. It has two commands, they're command line oriented commands. One's called UDP sender. And this is the basic uh, structure of a command. And the documentation, again, you can go to the website. Uh, it's udpcast.linux.lu. Um, but this is the basic format of the command that I'm using. And so uh, the first thing first here, uh, you know, you issue this at the command line, you specify dash dash file and the local file that you're going to transmit across the network to the, the client. Uh, in this case, the interface that you're using, uh, by default, I believe it's eth0, although for me, I'm using ax0 because I'm using uh, the packet radio. Uh, dash b block size, and in the paper, I explicitly you know, state that's not dash dash b, 
Uh, I don't know what was happening here, but dash B is what it is. It's not dash dash, so make sure you're, you recognize that. And this is the block size, and you can specify the block size. The default block size, I believe, is 1456, which corresponds to what you would expect on the Ethernet side. Again, most of these people that are using UDP cast are transmitting over 10 slash 100 or gigabit Ethernets and transmitting their entire operating system images here. I'm not. I've set my block size to 256, which reflects uh, the block size that's set on my uh, uh, TNC. Async, uh, when you start using that, these three commands here, async, fec, and max bitrate basically tell the, server, the sender, don't expect anybody to, to send anything back to you. You can use these in a, a synchronized means. I mean, you can get acknowledgments back. I don't. So these three, when you say async, the sender says, all right, I'm not going to get anything back from my, my uh, clients. Fec, is a means of allowing you to add forward error correction. And the nice thing about this is it's not set. It's not set based on the size of the file that you send. It's set by you. You have the control over how much or how little FEC you want to add to your uh, transmission. And so FEC is divided, divided into interleave and redundancy and stripe size. And on the next slide, I kind of, uh, well, another slide, I, I kind of highlight that a little bit. We're still playing with certain values of this. So for smaller files, uh, how much FEC do I need? For larger files, am I having some trouble? Do I need some additional redundancy? And so we're playing with levels of FEC. It's not one size fits all. I can change that. And, and again, we're still working with trying to define how much FEC we need for particular file sizes. Um, max bit rate here is based on BPS. I set that to 1200. Again, I'm doing uh, 1200 BPS. I'm using Cantronic KPC3 pluses, so I'm setting it 1200. That's the maximum bit rate. It does not necessarily mean that's the bit rate I'm going to get. And I'll show you that on a, on a real transmission. Um, these two here are really not necessary unless you're looking at some timing issues. Truthfully, you could probably leave those off if you're just wanting to transmit data. Um, log, what log does is cr allows you to create a log file. TCP or UDP cast will dump uh, basically instantaneous bandwidth information into a log file and you can keep track of that and it shows a certain time, it shows the instantaneous bandwidth at the server. Um, and you can specify how many seconds you want UDP cast to start dropping that data into this file. Right? The reason I'm using this is again, I'm, I'm looking at transmitting data uh, from a theoretical standpoint, I'm looking at speed issues. How quickly is UDP cast transmitting the data? It's, it's, a, it's a kludgy way of doing it. Really, I'd much, be, much rather be interested in what the client is seeing. But again, the server is not receiving any information from the client whatsoever. So there's no you know, backstream information being sent by the client to the sender. So I'm, I have to kind of kludge timing issues looking at it from the, the, the server. And so these two pieces allow me to get instantaneous bandwidth. And again, I can calculate uh, transmission time by taking the size of the file, dividing that by the instantaneous bandwidth to give me an idea of what the transmission time is. It's not exact. I'd wish there was something better. But again, at this point, this is what I've got. I'll work with it for a while until I find something better or I rework it so it works better for me. All right, so that's the basic sender command. Um, this is my attempt to try to just you know, tell you about this, the fact. We're still working with it, but the, the, the documentation, there's many areas in, within the, the udpcast.linux.lu website that talks about fact. I scoured the, 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 uh, the use groups for that, and this is the best that I can come up with. It. A file is divided into slices. Uh, slices are divided into stripes, and then FEC packets are added to each stripe to guard against burst errors. Um, these stripes, the slices are divided into slices or stripes, and then it, adjacent packets. Then you know, if you had four slice or four stripes, you know, packet one goes into one stripe, packet two. So adjacent packets aren't in the same stripe, and then you add redundancy to avoid against burst error. Um, if you're interested in that, I'd, I'd go to the the UDP cast website. I'm not going to elaborate on the FEC algorithm that's used. Uh, I haven't really, I haven't looked too much in that. Again, I'm more interested in how little FEC can I use to transmit medical or imagery that I'm going to be dealing with. All right. The receiver command in comparison is actually much simpler. Um, in this case, um, this is the file that you're going to receive. So I mean, I might send foo1 on, on the sender side and I can 
receive it as any file name that I want. It's just the stream of data is coming in, and I'm going to uh, siphon that off and put it into a local file of my own desire, the naming of my desired. Uh, no syncs, obviously, we're not going to be synchronized. We're not going to send anything back to the, the sender. And then this interface, of course, is the same interface that uh, the sender is transmitting. I'm using AX0 or AX, uh, AX0 for this. The hardware I have is, is less than a year old. Um, I bought uh, three different rigs. Uh, I've got two at work. I've got one at home, which annoys my wife greatly. Um, it's, it's just going to transform into something larger. So where are you going to put that? But don't worry about that, dear. Uh, so the stuff that I've got, I've got one in my office. I've got uh, one down in a lab, and I have one at home. Um, they're all they're, 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 they're similarly configured. I've got Dells uh, and their app name. I've got KPC 3 pluses across the board. I've got TM 271As, 2 meters. Um, I've got the IP addresses for my computers based off the amateur packet radio network standard. I have not been assigned uh, 44 dot IP addresses, but I am using the 44.128s, which are known within the, the Amper net to be research oriented. Uh, maybe if time permits, again, in that copious amounts of time that I have, I will actually secure 44 dot. But uh, I'm not connecting any of these to the internet. There's no, there's no intention to do that. Um, I've got another uh, GX40 here, which I've got some students using just for some research. I've got one kid doing some simulation stuff, and the other two are doing uh, uh, imagery issues. Uh, these are all attached to our local campus network and then out through the routers uh, and so on and so forth. I've got my machine connected to a, a 192.168, which is my router there. Again, similarly con configured, a few differences here or there. But... Um, this is what I'm using, and I've been using this for a couple months now to do uh, FTP and then now doing multicast. This is the sender command that I use. This is the output that's generated by that sender command. And so I have a slew of files. They're just basic text files. The name of the file shows how much data they're dealing with. I have files that go from 64 bytes up to a megabyte, and that's my upper range. And even a megabyte at, at, at 1,200 bot or 1,200 bits per second, I haven't done that yet. Um, I'm always worried that somebody else is going to want the packet channel in my local area, and my Elmer's like, "Don't worry about it. <laughs> Nobody's there." In fact, you might excite somebody. It's like, "What's going on? Somebody's blasting data over the packet channel." Um, the interface, of course, is our AX25, uh, the 256-byte. Uh, is based on the, the pack length set for the TPP, uh, async. Uh, for this file, I used uh, interleave of four, redundancy of one, and uh, what was that, stripe? The maximum bit rate in this case was 1,200 because that's the, the, the maximum for my, my TNC that I'm using. And again, on the next slide, you will see that I'm not actually getting 1,200. The server does not see an instantaneous bandwidth of 1,200 bond, or 1,200 bits per second. I just create a basic log file, and I, I request that UDP cast capture instantaneous bandwidth every five seconds. Now, I can change that. If it's a longer transmission, I might go to every 15 seconds or every 20 seconds or every 30 seconds, because otherwise this file gets fairly long. Uh, once you issue that command, um, the sender basically is sitting, and, and, and this is the, the deal here, I can issue the command. I usually issue the sender command first, and then I tell my clients, all right, start with your receive and in fact, let me go uh, forward and show this. This is the receiver command. And so I see UDP receiver. And again, I use the same file name that is on the server. It's like, all right, I'm going to cre create the same file here. No sync, and I'm using AX0. I start the server first. And it basically goes into a, a, a mode where it's broadcasting. And if I go back, it's broadcasting some control information saying, well, yeah, it's broadcasting here at 44.128.1. 44.128.1 is our, our local Amper network that I've created, and it's broadcasting on 255. It's broadcasting, so the clients, if they wish to connect, know about it. Now, the receivers then, I start the receiver second, and at that point then, the receivers sync up with the, the server or the sender, and then either the, client, the server or the sender or the, one of the receivers, all they have to do is just hit any key, and the transmission begins, and then the fun starts. So what you see here, then, 
is the output that occurs, and again, there's some synchronization stuff. I had to start the sender, I start all the, the receivers that want to receive the, tr the transmission. One of these guys, one of the, the end people that are in involved with this, hits any key and the, the transmission starts. And so this is the output, I kind of grade that out to kind of highlight that. Uh, this date is not the date at which it was sent. Uh, this is the date that's built into UCAS, the UDP CAS software. You'll see this on the sender also. I believe that's probably when it was last compiled or the revision date, something along that line. The multicast address that I'm using is a 136, but again, it's the 108, 128.1.1. One. Um, I'm sending such and such a file. This is the name of the server. I've got 44.128.1.1. I've got 1.2 and I got 1.3. Those are the machines that I have right now on the Amper net that I've created. Uh, press any key to start sending data. And here's where the data transmission starts. Now, what you're seeing here is the final transmission. What you will see when this occurs is on the server side and on the receivers, you will see this va these values change. Specifically, the number of bytes that will be transmitted. I've set it at 256 increments, so you'll start seeing the transmissions. The sender is sending uh, the first 256 bytes, and then you'll go to 10, 24, or 512, and, and so on and so forth. You'll see the sender change. The receivers then lag a little bit behind so the sender will send another block, and then the receivers will see it, and you'll see this synchronization. It's like I, the sender just sent, and the receiver just received, and you'll see them incrementing through until finally, the server finally finishes it. All right, in this case, it was a four kilobyte file, 4096 bytes were transmitted, transfer complete. Then if you look at the, the screens for the receiver, they're receiving, they're receiving, they're receiving. All right, 4096, they're done, and everybody, everybody's happy. This is what you see with the receiver side. Um, again, very similar. Uh, it's connected as a certain number, so it says, all right, I'm, I'm number zero. I'm listening on it. And again, th these numbers here start changing as the receiver starts receiving data. Um, this is the log file that is created by the server. You'll notice in this case, to do that four, mega or four kilobyte file, uh, it took uh, within a matter of uh, 20 different seconds here. I don't think it was actually 20, but. Uh, the instantaneous bandwidth started off at uh, f uh, 584 bits per second, and then it starts leveling off to 512. So what I do when I'm doing timings in is I take the values, I average them, and then uh, what I'll do is I'll take multiple timings. I'll do uh, several of these over a period of time, and then I'll calculate. What I've been doing recently is calculating 95% confidence intervals and saying, right, for a four kilobyte file, this is the average transmission time, or this is the average uh, geometric mean, so on and so forth, average transmission time that I would have for a particular four kilobyte file. And of course, I'm also recording the FEC level that I've included in that. And I can, again, I can change FEC. Um, again, I'm trying to use as li little amount of FEC as I can for these files and still allow them to be transmitted successfully. At this point, the, the largest file that I have transmitted using UDBcast, again, copious amounts of time, and being able to do multiple transmissions uh, within a certain period of time, the largest file that I've, I've been able to, to transmit uh, on my list is about an 8 kilobyte file, no, 16 kilobyte file. My next round is to doing 30 kilobyte, 32 kilobyte files, and then so on and so forth. But again, it's, we're still working on that. So. Again, for my requirements, I was not looking for a dedicated server. I wanted something that I could transmit at one time and then I could receive it another time. Um, the interesting thing about the tool, even though I've highlighted it, it does point to multipoint, I can, only ha I can use it as a single, a single sender and a single receiver. I don't have to have multiple receivers. Um, and I also set it into unicast mode. I have not done that. I've only used multicast. Um, but I have been successful in transmitting data from one of my three computers to the other two and, and, and doing that up through, like I said, the, the 16 kilobyte file size that I have. Um, again, the nice thing I like about UDP cast is any computer can transmit uh, using the sender command and if you want to be a receiver, you can do that using the receiver command. And again, it's, it's freely available. It's, uh, again, I found it on Fedora Core. You just go to add software, it's there. Once installed, you have the capability to multicast. It's quick and dirty. Um, and again, the, my purpose for this is to say, all right, you can do this. You can multicast if you hadn't thought about doing it. The software's there. And my intent with this paper and this presentation is like, here are the commands that I'm using. Again, sometimes digging through documentation is just painful. 
Uh, I kind of emulate what my students do is just, just let me have at it. Let me, let me see them. Let me play with this thing. I'll play with it a while. If I need some information, I'll go back and dig through the documentation. So, uh, of course, I don't tell my students to do that. I tell them to read the documentation, but you know what happens in reality. Um, you can define the amount of FEC. That's another aspect that I like. And again, I'm looking at trying to send as much as I can send through with that littlest amount of effect. I, I want to trans, if I could do it, I'd transmit pure bits and throw caution to the wind. But again, I'm looking at imagery issues. Um, and again, the next thing, other thing that I like is the fact that, you know, if you want to use Linux, Unix, that's fine. If you want to deal with the XP Windows operating system, that's fine too. I, I haven't played with the Linux, Unix, or the, the, the XP uh, Windows side of it. Again, that's another aspect. I might find a student that does that. But you could try that, and, and you have the capability of multicasting. So this is where we're at. Um, I've got a pot of money. I'm going to buy some more stuff. Uh, my wife's not happy about that. Uh, but I got more stuff at work. And so what you'll see here, and, and, and if you're interested, this is all available here. And, and really, I, I didn't create this for the, the presentation. It's just kind of dumb luck. You know, I work a lot on dumb luck. It works that I have this. It's basically so I can remember, oh, yeah, you need this piece of hardware. OK, where's that pot of money? I always like, all right, here's my pot of money. Or if a pot of money becomes available, what other pieces can I buy to fit into this? Um, so this is the one machine I have in my office. I've got uh, a, a five-foot diamond here. I'm going to get another five-foot diamond here. That always it brings looks in. It's like, what the heck have you got going on there? Um, so I'm going to have that. I'm going to have a, the, the KPC. I'm going to get a KPC 9612. I've got the TM271. I'm going to have the V71A here. And then I'm going to have two machines downstairs in my lab, one doing the 2 meter, one doing the, the 70 centimeter. And then at home, I'm basically going to replicate what I have in my office here uh, at home so I can transmit. So I have the capability of doing uh, multicast over 70 centimeter or multicast over 2 meter, depending upon what I want to do. Um, this other stuff here really isn't uh, uh, re relevant to the, the, t the topic of the, of the presentation. It's just other stuff. Uh, again, I'm doing research, but I'm also I'm, I'm building a, a teaching environment that I can deal with wireless. The nice thing about um, ham radio, at least some of the stuff that is coming to my mind, and if you haven't done this, it was kind of interesting. If you've never listened to multicast transmissions, it's really interesting. If you've listened to packet, it's probably boring by now. but you know, for me, it's like, all right, you know, I can talk about the theory of protocols, I can talk about multicast, I can talk about, you know, reliable with, uh, transmissions with acts. Actually being able to listen to that is a revelation. Because students, I can talk to them and tell them and show you, all right, you know, this is what happens. But be, having the ability to actually get an HT, I got a couple H, an HT that I'm going to get, I have. Being able to listen to that and say, all right, listen. There's a pure stream, that's a multicast, no acts. Here is a TCP transmission with FTP. Listen to the difference. And of course, then you've got the TNCs. You can see the transmission, the data. They don't get that a lot with their, their Wi-Fi stuff. You know, they don't have HTs where they're going to listen to the data. And that's actually kind of interesting from the standpoint of education, saying, all right, listen, you can see the data and you can hear the data. Does that help me understand what's going on? I'm hoping it does. That's another paper somewhere else. Um, this is really, oh, that's lovely. Right now, we're doing this. Uh, locally, we lost our DigiPeter. <laughs> that's another aspect. I want to get another DigiPeter on campus. I'm interested in this. I've got a student simulating using that NS simulator, these things. I want to be able to know what it takes to multicast data over HAPS, high altitude platforms. Leo. That's another aspect that I'm interested in. Obviously, Eris is there. That's an area that I'm looking at. Um, I'm hoping to learn a little bit more about how that works. And, and, and maybe exploring multicast to the extent. And then where I, when I did my dissertation, my PhD dissertation, we were looking at large file transmissions over geostationary at, or satellites. We were using uh, different uh, coding. Instead of using forward error correction, we were coming up with different coding forms. And so that is an area that I'm interested in also. And then finally, I've got two students. Again, I'm interested in imagery. And I'm not interested in the, 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 the regular formats, JPEG, GIF, PG, PNG. I'm interested in taking flat files or images, converting them into ASCII text <laughs> using XBigMap, XPicMap. My students have the ability to manipulate these files then. We're looking at. Uh, 
Those file images for uh, color CAT scans or X-rays, X-bitmap formatted X-rays, X-picmap formatted CAT scans, and then coming up with some means of maybe reordering the hex codes that represent the pixels to try to alleviate uh, the problems that you would get with a burst error. And so I've got two students that are working on that. Now, I, I, I put that into medical imagery because when you're looking for pots of money, uh, if you've got medical imagery and comp computational transmission, it looks a lot better. But truthfully, what I'm interested in from the ham radio side is like, I want to be able to transmit an image, uh, maybe a low quality with an XBM or XPM format, uh, you know, voice is great, don't get me wrong, but there, is, there are times when an image would actually help. And you know, I went to a local ham convention in Monroe, West Monroe, and there was an EM, ENT that was in, at the Superdome, and he said, you know, there were times when voice was great, but gosh, it would have been nice to be able to transmit an image. I want to be able to transmit the imagery as quickly as I can. I'm looking at multicast to do it with little or no feck involved. So another piece that we're investigating, uh, it's a pain to try to have a, a ham, a local ham, have all this software on their, their, their computer systems. Uh, if they're really interested, they'll do it. I'm looking also at live CDs and being able to distribute these tools available that I'm using and say, all right, this is how you could do it using the live CD, configuring it with a, a web-based interface that's local to that computer, give the local uh, Aries e-communicator uh, some information, or here's your IP address, here's what you're going to put in for your call sign, and then set that up and have that available to them so that they can start doing uh, data e-com quickly. These are the people that are helping fund me, uh, and these, uh, these two people here, that's my Elmer, and then my wife, nothing gets out the door without her looking at it, so uh, I should be paying her, I suppose, for the editing and putting up with my ham radio stuff, but all in the name of research. So I, she has a lab at work, so I don't have to worry about that. She doesn't have to bring her home, stuff home, so. Questions? Two simple questions. One, have you considered using something like AGWPE, which is a software TNC to minimize hardware, and it's just a thing that you install, and that way it's more transparent? And I, I have not, no. Um, I have, no, I have not. The other thing is it's free. Um, the, other, the other question I had is, in MCOM, bandwidth, of course, is, is important. You don't want to congest things, mm -hmm. sending messages that nobody cares about. Sure. Um, it's kind of like a tree in the forest, if it, yep. right? Have you considered using IGMP or adding a, a layer of IGMP to do what is more traditional multicast, that if nobody's listening, nobody's transmitting, and if you have listeners, they automatically check in and let you know they are listening or are continuing to listen. So if for whatever reason somebody goes offline, you're not sending out data to them anticipating that they're actually yeah. receiving it. Um, at, at this point, I have not. And it's the, the protocol that I envision is that within an environment of e-com, you've got your EOC that is commanding and is, is basically dictating, ba based on voice, what happens when. Right? So I envision, and again, I, I, I've modeled this after the, what happens locally, you know, for example, with Gustav and Ike, is that the entire city gets turned into a shelter. I mean, we had 10,000 people uh, with Gustav, and you've got 2 million people leaving the coast, and 10,000 10, of them show up in Monroe. Uh, the basketball arena was turned into uh, a special needs facility for medical uh, patients. And so we have people out there doing this. I suspect, at least in my head, I envision as far as the transmission of who's available and who wants to receive is going to be dictated by that voice EOC. Sorry, right, so and so, I have such and such to send. Who wants to receive it? EOC says, all right, who wants to receive that? You check in, it's all right, I'm going to send now. So there's still an amount of voice communication that's going to have to occur for, here I'm a sender, I'm going to send, if you want to receive this, activate UDP, you'll receive now, and go. And in the concept of having a protocol done automatically, I haven't, I haven't gone to that. I, I hadn't envisioned that yet. It may be something we do in the future. Yes, sir. Oh, very nice presentation. Thank you. About live CDs, there's a book that came out about a year ago that talks about uh, live Linux CDs, and you just do a search on Amazon for live, yeah. live Linux CDs, and it tells you how to do it. It's quite easy. Uh, yeah, I, I've, a, I've attempted it a couple times, and I haven't found a simple solution. And, I, and, and 
again, it's, it's a copious amounts of time reading a book. I could probably do that. I'm hoping that I'm going to snatch an a, a, a undergraduate and say, hey, would, would you be interested in doing this? Uh, most of the students that I run into now are, are really interested in Ubuntu, and I'm still using Fedora. I may end up going to Ubuntu just because they're interested in Ubuntu, and if I can get everything to work under Ubuntu, that's fine. I mean, I, the Linux operating system doesn't matter to me. This isn't so much uh, how you're doing it, but how did you pick your multicast group address? I'm wondering, because you, you, know, you bothered to pick a normal IP address, but you pick a reserved, um, not supposed to be used. Multicast oh, no, group the, address. The 44128? No, the 236. 236 the two, in That the was reserved. done by IP, UDP cast. UDP cast did that for me automatically. I didn't. It basically, it's using a directed broadcast, which basically means that multicast is not going outside of this local area network, which was my 44.128.1. Right, so right, but UDP there's a set of reserved addresses for that in the 239. 236 is not assigned out and supposed to not be used. I, but if you didn't pick it, then... No, no, UDPCast did that for me. and it, it's a, it should be. Actually, the UDPCast, the multicasts are 224 to 239. So 236 does run within that range. It's just that UDPCast is using 236 for that. There's a whole range, but just like IP addresses, they're assigned. Yeah. And 236 is reserved, just like uh, one dot uh, is all reserved. Again, I'd have to go dig into the, uh, the UDP CAS software and see why they chose 236. But again, they're using 236.128.1.x for that. All right. Great. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Paul.